Hey everyone, Mike Vlock here. I wanted to spend our time together looking at the issue of Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, and specifically the issue of coming to life or resurrection that's discussed in this verse. You may be aware that there's a lot of debate concerning the resurrection that's mentioned uh, in this particular verse. You may also be aware that when it comes to millennial issues, you know, uh, millennial positions, amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennialism, that there's a disagreement on uh, the coming to life or the resurrection that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Uh, amillennialists and postmillennialists uh, see that there's some sort of spiritual resurrection in the current age that's being referred to, whereas premillennialists believe that there is a, a future bodily resurrection that's uh, that's being referred to in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Just so you know, I am a premillennialist, so I agree with the uh, the premillennial uh, view on this uh, on this issue. So because of the debate about the verse, what's the resurrection implications for millennial views, I just thought it'd be good to take a few minutes to, to look at this. And what I will be arguing is I, I do think that Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 is, is clearly referring to a future bodily resurrection. But let's go ahead and take a look at uh, this issue. And so we'll go ahead and entitle this message, And They Came to Life, Bodily Resurrection of Believers in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, we're told, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. We're going to show that Revelation 20, verse 4, predicts a future bodily resurrection of Christian martyrs after Jesus' second coming to earth. And then on the flip side, Revelation 20 verse 4 is not referring to a spiritual resurrection before Jesus returns to earth. So this is not a reference to uh, a spiritual regeneration. Uh, this resurrection is not referring to spiritual salvation. It is not referring to deceased saints uh, in heaven. So any type of view that would say that this is a spiritual resurrection in this current age, uh, we would disagree with that because we think the evidence is pointing heavily uh, towards the view that what's being described in Revelation 20 verse 4 is a future bodily resurrection. I think when all the evidence is looked at, we're going to see that this view is accurate based on context. So remember when we're studying a verse and trying to come to some uh, theological implications here, we have to take account of the context. So I think this view that there's going to be a future bodily resurrection, and that's what Revelation 20 verse 4 is talking about, that's going to be found in the immediate verse context. It's also going to be found in the surrounding paragraph context. I think this is also going to be supported by understanding the literary section in which Revelation 20 verse 4 comes in, which is Revelation 19, 11 through Revelation 21 verse 8. So the literary section context will point towards this view as well. I would also say it's consistent with the book context, which is the whole entire book of Revelation. It's also consistent with the issue, the genre context, because Revelation is a prophecy. And there's a lot of symbols associated with that prophecy. And so when we properly account for the genre of Revelation, this will lend towards the view that there's a future bodily resurrection. And then it's also consistent with the whole Bible context. So as we're trying to make our argument here, we're trying to pay attention to the context, not only the very, very immediate context of this verse, but the broader context as well. Now, just a few introductory matters about Revelation. Uh, uh, most believe strong evidence internally, externally seems to indicate that the book is written in the 90s AD. And what you end up having here is Jesus showed John the Apostle truths, sig signifying to him various truths um, that often will be in the form of symbols. But Jesus is showing uh, John things, uh, you know, concerning the present, but also many things concerning the future. And also, as I just mentioned earlier, uh, Revelation is actually one of the books where the genre is stated. So the genre is stated to be prophecy on multiple occasions. 
So in chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, there's also other references to well as well. Uh, that revelation is stated to be a prophecy. Now, we know that there are going to be many symbols that are used for this prophecy, so it'll be very similar to Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah and some, uh, some of the biblical books. There's also going to be some parallels with the genre of non-inspired apocalyptic literature, which oftentimes used a lot of symbols as well. Uh, but we believe good hermeneutics will reveal uh, that behind symbols will be literal meanings. And then if we do our due diligence and look at context and um, various uh, things that are surrounding uh, the mention of the symbols, that we can come to a pretty good conclusion on the literal meaning of symbols and what they mean when they're all put together. So there's eight main sections in the book of Revelation. And uh, these sections, you know, for all the debate over Revelation and how hard it is to understand allegedly, um, you know, there's the sections uh, that are there are actually pretty easy to identify. Now, again, I understand you could go into even more depth than what I have here, but just in general, the main sections of Revelation are pretty well agreed upon. There's a prologue in Revelation in chapter one, verses one to eight. And then there's the, the letters to the seven churches. That's usually what we think of in chapters two and three. Technically, it starts at you know, chapter one, verse nine through chapter three, verse 22. And then there's this heavenly court and its judgments. That's very clear in Revelation 4 and 5. And then that extends through uh, chapter 11. And then there, there's going to be a couple sections that are apocalyptic prophetic narrative. And so we see the first of, of that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through chapter 16. And then the very significant section of you have the fall of Babylon that's mentioned in uh, chapter 17, verse 1 through chapter 19, verse 10. And that's where you get a lot of discussion of uh, religious Babylon and then economic political Babylon. Uh, there you see that Babylon, you know, is the capital city and represents uh, wickedness. Uh, the nations, the kings of the earth, the people of the earth are participating in the wickedness of Babylon. There's also persecution of God's people. So it's a very negative scene that's described there. But there's going to be a fall because uh, God is going to deal with Babylon. And then you, you, and then very importantly, uh, you know, you get to this section here of the, the next apocalyptic prophetic narrative section, which is nineteen eleven through twenty one eight, which is where we find our verse, Revelation chapter twenty, verse four. So now I, I want to mention the next part of it, uh, the next number seven, then come back to number six. But in number seven, there's going to be the new Jerusalem established. So in twenty one nine through twenty two nine. You have descriptions of the New Jerusalem, and then uh, you have epilogue in 2210 through through the rest of the book in, in 2221. But one of the things that should be noted here that I think is important is because remember, the view that we're arguing for takes into account the literary sections within Revelation. So notice with the fifth main section here, you have the fall of Babylon, and then you have the apocalyptic narrative of 1911 through 218 which is centered around the return of Jesus Christ to earth and then these events that are associated with it. And what ends up being important about this section is that in this sixth section that we're mentioning here, this is a transition that brings you from the influence of Babylon to the establishment and influence of the new Jerusalem. So there's a sense in which you could say 1911 through 218 is a bridge that gets you from the awful situation of Babylon and its wicked influence to the righteous new Jerusalem, where uh, at, in this particular state, God's people are rewarded, they're reigning, there's fellowship, and even the nations and the kings of the earth are presented in a positive sense. So it'll be very significant that it's very significant to understand that 1911 through 218 is functioning as a unit describing events associated with the second coming of Christ that transitions us from the influence, the satanic influence of Babylon to the wonderful eternal state situation uh, that's found, you know, uh, in, in 21, 9 through uh, 22, verse 9. And, uh, you know, as I just mentioned, just to bring this uh, home again, Revelation 20, so how does, how does Revelation 20, verse 4 relate to what we're, we've been saying? Revelation 20, verse 4 comes in the section of apocalyptic or prophetic narrative of 1911 through 218, describing the transition from the fall of Babylon to the establishment of the new Jerusalem. So the events in this particular section, 1911 through 218, describes the second coming of Christ, and then all these events associated with it, including resurrection, including the kingdom of the Messiah, and including various other things that will lead to the situation found in Revelation 21 and 22.
So at this particular point now, let's dive down because I, you know we've set the context. Let's talk about five reasons why Revelation 20 verse 4 refers to physical resurrection. And the first one is going to be is that physical resurrection of Christian martyrs, and that's really what we're going to be talking about here is what's, what's the physical resurrection about in Revelation 20 verse 4? It's about people who belong to Christ, who are in union with him, who were saved, who because they were saved, they were uh, persecuted and put to death and therefore are in need of physical resurrection. So the first point that we're going to argue is that physical resurrection of Christian martyrs is a natural reading of Revelation 19.11 through 21.8. And so what you see here, again, obviously there's a lot of material here and we're just being very brief. Uh, uh, these sections that are mentioned here are usually introduced by, in Greek, what are called chi idon formulas, chi idon, which in your Bibles is usually translated, and I saw, or then I saw. And uh, these seem to be indicating a progression of events in associated with the second coming of Christ. So again, it's 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 a part of a of, of a description of events occurring with the second coming of Christ. So in 1911, through 16, this is introducing Jesus's return to earth. So you've had this big discussion about Babylon, and now Jesus is the one who is going to come and deal uh, with wicked Babylon and the kings of the earth and, that are, and all that's taking place on the earth at this time. And then in 19, chapter 19, verses 17 to 18, there's going to be a call to assemble for the supper of God, which involves the judgment of the enemies with Jesus's return. And then in 19, 19 to 21, that's where you have, with Jesus's return to earth, um, defeat of kings of the earth, their armies, the beast, and the false prophet. And we're told in Revelation 19, 15, that, G that Jesus is coming to, he will rule the nations uh, with a rod of iron. And so really what you have here, particularly at the end of chapter 19, is the defeat of the kings of the earth, the armies, the beast, who's an antichrist figure, the false prophet. And then when you get to chapter 20, this this the flow of the event continues because at that particular point, um, the head of the snake literally is dealt with. Remember, the enemies of Christ are being dealt with at the end of Revelation 19 and the beginning of Revelation 20. And that's when you have the binding of Satan. And then not just the binding of Satan in the sense of, you know, nations can't be deceived anymore, which is going to be true, but his presence is actually removed from the earth. So he's actually placed into the abyss. He's placed into a pit where he no longer has access to the earth at all anymore for this particular period of time. And then you come to the section that we're talking about today. Um, you end up having resurrection of martyred saints um, to reign with Jesus for a thousand years. And then it talks about a second resurrection of the after the thousand year reign of Christ. So Jesus comes, Jesus's enemies are dealt with, and then there's a resurrection of believers that takes place. And then you're going to have other events too. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 to 10 is going to talk about Satan being released from the abyss for a short time. He makes a final assault on planet Earth. There's those who join him in that. They're eventually, you know, they're sent to the lake of fire. And then in the uh, next section, there's going to be a great white throne judgment. And then you're going to, you know, within this literary section, you end up having the introduction of the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, which will then be further described when you get to chapter 21, verse 9. So really, the point that we're making here, is, this is not our only point, but it just makes a lot of sense in the flow of things. Chapter 19 is second coming of Christ. Christ deals with his enemies. Chapter 20, Satan's bound. His presence is removed from the earth. And then there's a resurrection of believers, a thousand-year reign of Christ, and then a resurrection of what appears to be unbelievers after that, and then some other events that take place. So there's certainly not anything unnatural <laughs> about the idea of there being a physical resurrection of martyrs. Uh, in connection with the second coming of Christ. But there's also other texts that link Jesus's return with physical resurrection. You know, if you read Philippians 3, 20 to 21, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 23, 1 John 3, 2, those are all texts that indicate that when Jesus comes again, that there's resurrection of believers that is associated with that. So remember earlier when we were talking about the various contexts, I mean, this would be part of that whole Bible context, which is it's it's very consistent with other passages in the Bible. You know, we could even go to Daniel 12 and other passages, you know, Old Testament passages that have references to resurrection that, you know, after a time of tribulation, and then when the Lord returns, there ends up being resurrection of believers. That's that's pretty consistent with, with other passages. Okay, now we come to our uh, second reason uh, for why there's physical bodily resurrection in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, 
And that is the term for came to life. So remember there, you have that reference to came to life. And, and, and it's, it's the Greek term ezason. And so the term for came to life, which is ezason in Greek, is used in the context of, in this context of Christian martyrs in need of physical resurrection. So this is very significant. And, and by the way, this came to life could just be translated, they lived. They lived. Um, they came to life. And so, again, remember, context is very important. So who are these individuals that lived, that came to life? In this particular context, it's people who belong to Jesus who lost their physical lives because they belong to Jesus. But notice in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And then notice when you get to the last two lines here, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So who are those who came to life in this particular context? It's those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. This is not talking about a spiritual resurrection. This is talking about a physical resurrection um, because these are people that already knew Christ. They already had been spiritually saved. And I think it's important to understand that what you have in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, is really the fulfillment of the expectation of Revelation 6, 9 to 11 where you have the, the martyrdom that is associated with the fifth seal of Revelation chapter 6. So what you have here is martyrdom of believers. So verse 9 says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. That's very similar to Revelation chapter 20, right? They cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So notice that these are, these are saints who they, they've been killed. Their spirits are now in heaven, but they want vengeance on the earth. They want the Lord to reign upon the earth. They want the Lord to deal with, with their enemies. And then verse 11 says, and there was given to each of them a white robe. And they were told that they noticed that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So they're killed, um, their souls are in heaven, and they want the Lord to take care of the situation on the earth, but they're told to wait a little while. So in other words, the, uh, the desire that they have for righteousness to prevail is not to be fulfilled at this time, but it will be soon. It will be in the future from their standpoint. And so thus, when you come to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, uh, th their, their godly desire comes to fruition at that point. They, they sit on thrones, and then they're going to they're gonna reign with Christ for a thousand years. And so they come to life, and they reign with Christ. And therefore, when you think of Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, think of Revelation 6, 9 to 11. And then there's also other texts in Revelation 2 that talk about martyrs as well. So again, uh, the people being resurrected is very significant. These are people who knew Christ. Uh, they were so strongly committed to him that they physically lost their life. They wanted justice. And then when you get to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, they're raised from the dead. They reign with Christ. They get a reign in the realm of their death, of their persecution. So just to sum this up, those who come to life in Revelation 20, verse 4, are Jesus' followers who were physically killed in Revelation 6, 9 to 11. People die because they follow Jesus. They're, they're already spiritually saved. You could say they're already spiritually resurrected, but they're in need of physical resurrection. And therefore, Jesus physically resurrects those who died for him, and then they reign with him. Now, that brings us to our third point, our third argument for future bodily resurrection in Revelation 20, verse 4. And that's that the term that's used in Revelation 20, verse 4, as a son came to life, is used of bodily resurrection in chapter 20, verse 5, the very first part of the verse. So literally in the immediate two-verse context, we're going to have a reference to as being physical resurrection. So 20, verse 5a says, the rest of the dead did not come to life as a son until the thousand years were completed. Now, what's interesting about this is that all Orthodox Christians, and you know, including those of all the millennial views, including amillennials, postmillennials, they agree that chapter 20, verse 5 is talking about physical resurrection. So they will they would admit as Aeson uh, came to life, they lived, refers to physical resurrection. But ironically, they say 
the non premillennials do that came to life in verse four is a spiritual resurrection. Uh, that in such close context, everybody agrees. Verse five is talking about physical resurrection, but some want to say in verse four, it's spiritual resurrection. And so this is very, very strong evidence. So we have a, we have the same word used where everybody agrees it's physical resurrection in verse five. And it makes a lot of sense to see it as physical resurrection uh, in verse four. So it's very unlikely that the same term as a song would be used in different ways in verses four and five. Another reason, which is a, uh, a fourth reason, is going to be found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. But the word for came to life, as Asan in Revelation 20, verse 4, is used of Jesus' physical resurrection from the dead in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. So not only is it used of physical resurrection for sure in verse 5, it's also used for sure of physical resurrection in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, where we're told, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. So this is Jesus speaking. He says he has come to life as a son. So chapter two, verse eight, as a son is used of Jesus's bodily resurrection. We know it's a bodily resurrection. Everybody agrees in verse five, chapter 20, verse five, that is a son is used of physical resurrection. And then it, the very strong, extremely likely conclusion is that is a son in Revelation chapter 20, Verse four refers to bodily resurrection, and we're actually told it's of martyrs. So very strong evidence from the use of a zason. So we're finding that all the contexts are coming together for this view of physical bodily resurrection. Immediate verse context. Uh, the next verse points towards that. The whole book of Revelation points towards that. Consistent use of a zason in Revelation points toward that. Bible context, which talks about physical resurrection in association uh, with the second coming of Christ. And then that brings us to our fifth uh, reason. Again, this is very strong in my opinion, that this came to life in Revelation 20 verse 4 is actually called resurrection in Revelation chapter 20 verse 5b, or in reference to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, we're told this is the first resurrection. And the word that is used for resurrection there is anastasis. Remember, came to life is azason. But this azason is called resurrection, which is anastasis. Now, if you have time to do it, <laughs> go online. It's easier to do uh, word searches with the internet these days. Look at anastasis in the New Testament. You'll find it's used 42 times. Many scholars have argued, and I agree rightly, that every single use of anastasis in the New Testament refers to physical resurrection. There's one case in Luke chapter 2 where there's you know, a little bit of this and that, even though I actually think that verse ultimately could have physical resurrection in view. Uh, it talks about the rise and fall of, of, of certain people uh, in Israel uh, in, in, Luke, in Luke chapter 2 which um, eventually can include physical resurrection. It's certainly not talking about spiritual resurrection. So the point that we're getting here is anastasis, resurrection, is clearly a reference to bodily resurrection uh, in, uh, in the Bible, and it's the same for what we're seeing in this particular context. So we could say that anastasis, resurrection, explains azason. So thus, the came to life is Aeson equals what? The bodily resurrection of Anastasis. So now, even if we didn't have Anastasis, I think the evidence is so clearly in favor of physical resurrection that we would believe it anyway. But this, this just makes it almost basically 100% certain that we're referring to physical bodily resurrection. And therefore, what would be the, uh, what would be the, the theological implications of this? Now, again, remember that the important thing is that our theology has to be derived from the Bible, from the text, and what it's saying in context. It should not be the case that we have a theology and then we want Scripture to fit into what we already believe. But what we're seeing here are clearly inescapable theological conclusions and implications. One of them is that the resurrection of believers in Revelation 20, verse 4, is a future event. It is a future bodily resurrection of believers in Christ who physically were killed, who have now been raised to physical life. And since bodily resurrection has not happened yet, because in Orthodox Christianity, 
everybody acknowledges Jesus, the first fruits has been raised from the dead. But according to 1 Corinthians 15, though, those who are his at his coming, that has not occurred yet. So the wide scale resurrection of Christian uh, believers, those who are in Christ, believers in God has not happened yet. So it must happen with Jesus' second coming. So if Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 is talking about resur physical resurrection of believers, and that hasn't happened yet, it still needs to happen in the future. And it will happen as a result of Jesus's return. And therefore, it's inescapable that this supports premillennialism. Because remember, premillennialism is saying is that the, king, the, the kingdom of Christ, the earthly 1,000-year reign of Christ, comes after the second coming of Christ. So there must be a bodily resurrection of believers after Jesus' second coming to bring in the thousand-year reign of Jesus and the saints. So when you look at the order here, uh, you have Jesus returns to earth, Revelation 19, and then you have the bodily resurrection of believers. Of course, that comes right after you know Satan being removed from his presence from the earth in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. But you have bodily resurrection of believers. And then you have a thousand-year reign of Jesus and believers. Because remember, this group comes to life and they reign with Christ for a thousand years. So Jesus comes, there's resurrection of believers, there's a reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then there's a bodily resurrection of, uh, of, of people. And I think in this context, they would be unbelievers in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. So this whole scenario strongly um, attest to the accuracy of, of premillennialism. If you're a premillennialist, you have very uh, strong reasons uh, to believe that particular view. As a matter of fact, I would say that I think this case for physical resurrection in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, physical resurrection believers is so strong, but I think you probably have to have strong theological assumptions to the contrary in order not to see this. In other words, the evidence is so overwhelming, so extremely likely that I think there, you're probably dealing with theological assumptions about how things should be to not come up with the view that Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 is referring to future physical bodily resurrection. Now, of course, this is not an area of salvation. This is not an area of godliness. There's a lot of good people who you know, disagree on Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. So this needs to be a matter of friendly debate. With that said, though, the evidence makes uh, Revelation 20, that Revelation 20, verse 4 is referring to future bodily resurrection, I think is extremely likely and uh, therefore really heavily uh, supports the view of premillennialism. So anyway, I hope this discussion on Revelation 20 verse 4 has been helpful, and we'll see you later.